Part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is beginning there in verse number seven, where the Bible reads, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And the title of my sermon tonight is this, Iceland, a nation of bastards. Iceland, a nation of bastards. Now, let me start out by just giving you the dictionary definition of the word bastard. Uh, dictionary.com has this as definition number one. A person born of unmarried persons, an illegitimate child. So when we use the word bastard, and I'm not using it as a slang word tonight, I'm using it as its uh, literal meaning of being a person who is born to parents that are not married to one another, an illegitimate child. Now I have an article here in my hand called, Is Marriage Outdated in Iceland? This is from CNN. What would a society look like without marriage? The question popped into my brain after I stumbled across a list of countries with the most unwed mothers, with 40% of its babies born out of wedlock. America sits near the middle of the global pack in this category. Conservative Turkey brings up the rear with a scant 3%. And the nation at the top of the list, the world leader in single moms, Iceland. More than two-thirds of Icelandic babies, 67%, are born to parents who are not married. Now, that is why I call tonight Iceland a nation of bastards, because 67% of children in Iceland are being born to unwed mothers. Now, the United States is not far behind, with 40% being born to unwed mothers. Listen to the article as it continues. This might be a shameful distinction in many spots around the world. In the land of the Vikings, it's a point of pride. They're proud of it. They're proud to be in it. You say, well, I think it's offensive that you're preaching a sermon called Iceland, the nation of bastards, but they're proud tonight to be a nation of bastards. Now, if you would look in the Bible at Zechariah chapter nine, I'm gonna show you a few other places where the Bible uses this term bastard that so many people are uncomfortable with. But I'll tell you why we're uncomfortable with it because it's 40% of our nation. That's why we're not comfortable with it. But we need to get back to the old paths where it is the good way. We need to get back to biblical morality and biblical preaching so that we don't become like Iceland, a nation of bastards. You say, well, I find that offensive. Then you find the Bible offensive. And if you don't like hard preaching, you're in the wrong place tonight. This is where the Bible is going to be preached without apology, uncensored, uncut. This is what the Bible says. Look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 5. Ascalon shall see it in fear. And let me just mention to you that these places that are being named are the five cities of the Philistines. He says, Ashkelon shall see it in fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. Look at verse 6. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. And let me ask you this. According to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 6, is a bastard something to be proud of? No, he said if a bastard dwells there, the pride is cut off from that place. Look, if you would, at Deuteronomy chapter number 23. It's another place in the Bible that used the term bastard. Deuteronomy chapter 23. The Bible says in verse number one, he that is wounded in the stones or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, obviously, we're not living in the Old Testament with the tabernacle of the congregation and the holy place and the most holy place where certain people are allowed to enter and not enter because of various reasons. But the principle is here, though, that being a bastard is not a good thing. If God said that in the Old Testament congregation, the bastard should not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even under the 10th generation, that's a pretty serious prohibition. But it's a point of pride, they say. This reminds me of Philippians chapter number three. You don't have to turn there. But the Bible reads, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, 
that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Did you hear that? Their glory is in their shame. The Bible's talking about people who are actually proud of things that they ought to be ashamed of. Right. They ought to be ashamed of the fact that all these women are getting knocked up without being married and committing the sin of fornication, which is condemned over and over again in the New Testament. But they say, no, it's wonderful to be a nation of bastards. It's wonderful to have 67% of babies born to a single mother, not a mom and a dad, not a normal family situation, but a bastard situation. Here's another uh, bit of the article here. They have this uh, Icelandic woman being interviewed you have this horrible term in English, broken families. Brindis Asmund's daughter says over coffee, which basically means if you get divorced that something's broken. But that's not the way it is in Iceland at all. We live in such a small and secure environment and the women have so much freedom so you, you can just choose your life. Brindis has three kids with two partners and not a drop of shame or regret. Well, the Bible talks about people who commit sins and commit abominations and they have no shame and they don't even blush. And that's what we see today in the nation of Iceland. Now, turn if you would to Isaiah chapter 13. Many people have found it bizarre that I sometimes will preach whole sermons against certain countries, right? Like they think it's weird or crazy. Like what, it, what in the world are you thinking when you preach a sermon against France? Or what in the world are you doing preaching a sermon against Iceland? This kind of preaching is crazy. And, and where do you come up with this sermon idea? But here's the thing. People who are balking at this or surprised by this, it just shows that they don't know the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, this is a genre of preaching in the Bible. In fact, look at Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Then we proceed to have an entire sermon against Babylon. Now flip over to chapter 15. The burden of Moab. Now there's a whole sermon against Moab. All the sins of Moab, all the judgment that God's going to bring. He explains what's wrong with Moab. Then go to chapter 17. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. Look at chapter 19. I mean, look, this is just one book of the Bible. This is just Isaiah, let alone Jeremiah, let alone Ezekiel, let alone the minor prophets. You'll find the same thing. People who actually read the Bible know this to be true. Yeah. Look, if you would, at chapter 19, verse 1, the burden of Egypt. Here's a sermon against Egypt. You know, look at chapter 23, the burden of Tyre. Howl ye ships of Tarshish for its laid waste so that there's no house nor entering in from the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. And we could go on and on and show you all the sermons in the Bible that were directed at this nation, that nation, this city. That's, you say, well, why does Iceland get its own sermon, though, when it's such a small place? There's only 330,000. Well, listen, there are more people living in Iceland today than were probably living in Damascus when the book of Isaiah was written, or were writ living in Tyre. Why? Because everybody can learn from these sermons against these different places because these sins are common to man. And like I pointed out, the United States is following in these footsteps in some ways. And so we need to take heed and preach and uh, make sure that our country doesn't go down this path any faster than it already is. But this sermon is about the wickedness of Iceland today, the burden of Iceland, a nation of bastards, a feminist hell is another way I would refer to this nation. Now go, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. I'm sorry to confuse you with the Bible tonight, but the Bible is not a book that just condones of everything and doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings, so we're just going to act like it's okay to go sleeping around when you're not married. And we're just going to act like it's okay to just have kids out of wedlock and everything. Look, you're wrong if you think that's what Christianity is. And you say, well, this is the Old Testament. What about Jesus? Jesus preached the same type of sermons. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. He preached against the places in his area. He said, and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. That's what Jesus preached about the cities of wickedness in his day. 
Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. The Bible reads, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. The Bible teaches that you get married and then you bear children. That's the biblical order. You don't have children when you're not married. And you don't commit the act that causes children when you're not married. You're supposed to be pure when you get married. You're supposed to be a virgin when you get married. That's what the Bible teaches. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. There is a movement today all over Europe where women just want to have kids and they don't want to be married. I watched a documentary about Germany and they were interviewing all these women in Germany that were saying, we have no desire to get married. We don't want to have a husband. We just want to have kids. I just want to have a child. I just want to be a single mother. That's wicked. That is godless. That is not a, bi a biblical philosophy and that is not something that our society should accept as a normal way to live your life. Amen. Flip over the page, a few pages to the right in Titus chapter 2. You say, let people do whatever they want. I, okay, I'm not going to stop you from producing bastard children tonight. You go out there and open your feet unto everyone that passes by, as the Bible says, and you know what? Go ahead and do it. It's no skin off my back, but I'm going to call a spade a spade tonight, and I'm going to preach what the Bible says about it. Yeah, people are free to do whatever they want. They're free to live a miserable, foolish life. They're free to commit all kinds of sins and abominations, and they're free to face the punishment of God for their actions. Yeah. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Notice the order there. Love their husbands, love their children. What's the priority? Their husband comes first and then the children. They love their husbands, they love their children, to be discreet, chaste. What does chaste mean or chastity? It refers to keeping yourself pure where you're only... Uh, having that physical act with the person that you're married to and not people that you're not married to. It says that they be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. What, is that? what does keeper at home mean? It means housekeeping, taking care of the house. It's not saying that they never leave the house, but it's saying that they take care of the house, uh, sort of like where God put Adam in charge of the Garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. What did it mean when God told Adam to keep the garden? It meant that he's supposed to take care of it. If we were to talk about a groundskeeper, we're talking about somebody who keeps up on the landscaping. So a housekeeper is someone who takes care of the house. The keeper at home is one who maintains the affairs of the house. And the Bible says that they are to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The Bible teaches that wives are to obey their husbands. The Bible teaches that women are supposed to be married to their husband and love him and honor him and produce children with him that grow up in a home where there's a mother and a father in the home and where they raise that child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Anything other than that model is sin. Amen. It's sin. But in contrast to what the Bible teaches, we have the so-called feminist movement. Now, the feminist movement claims to be a movement about exalting women, but it actually destroys the lives of both men and women. And it also destroys the lives of children that grow up in broken homes and have all kinds of problems and issues as a result of growing up in that type of situation. I went to Wikipedia and I typed in feminist movement to Wikipedia. Here's what I found. The women's movement effected change in Western society, including women's suffrage, the right to initiate divorce proceedings, no-fault divorce, the right of women to make individual decisions regarding pregnancy, including access to contraceptives and abortion, and the right to own property. So these five things are listed as the accomplishments of the feminist movement. So when they want to brag about what they've accomplished and the wonderful things that they've brought to our society, here's what they've brought us. They brought us, number one, suffrage, which means the right for women to vote in elections. Then they brought us the right to initiate divorce proceedings and no-fault divorce. Now, why is the feminist movement 
responsible for bringing us the no-fault divorce? Or why would women want to bring about this no-fault divorce where women can just divorce their husband for no reason or husbands can just divorce their wives for no reason? Uh, it also says that the feminist movement has brought us the right of women to make individual decisions regarding pregnancy. Translation. It gave them the right to murder their own baby, which they call abortion. The Bible calls it murder. And of course, the right to own property. Now, I'm not against women owning property unless by that that they mean that they can somehow own property apart from their husband, like that they would get married to their husband and their husband has no access or control over their property. I don't believe in that. I believe that when people get married, then it should be community property with the husband as the head of the home which is the way it is in Arizona, by the way. It's also led to broad employment for women at more equitable wages and access to university education. So this is what women have accomplished for themselves. They've accomplished easy divorce. Isn't that something to be proud of? We can murder our babies and we can have easy divorce and it's all feminist. It's feminism, it's so wonderful. It's so uplifting to women. No, it's not, it's disgusting. Now this no-fault divorce, remember what I read in the, in the article about Iceland. What'd she say? Oh, you know, like you guys act like something's broken when, when divorce happens. No, divorce is, yay, divorce! Yay, bastards! Yay, we're all bastards, it's great! Yeah, it's great to be a whore! But here it says, you know, oh no, divorce is great. Divorce is cool, according to this woman. There's nothing broken about it. But listen to this, did you know, and most people don't even realize this no-fault divorce is new. Did you know that the first no-fault divorce law in the United States was in 1969 in California only? 1969. So before 1969, you couldn't just divorce your wife because you're sick of her. You couldn't just divorce your husband because you're sick of him or just because you don't like him. You had to go to court. If you wanted to divorce your spouse before 1969, you had to go to court and say, you know, my spouse committed adultery or my spouse, you know, is whatever. That you had to prove that there was a reason why you were getting a divorce. And it had to be a serious reason. And a judge had to decide, okay, that's a good enough reason. Or he would just say, well, no, you can't just get a divorce because you're not compatible. You know, are you a man? Are you a woman? Then you're compatible. <laughs> But listen to this. A lot of people don't realize that in 1968, the Soviet Union came out with their no-fault divorce law in 1968. And then in 1969, California followed suit with the law that was almost worded the same way in many places, following suit. And then after California had the easy divorce law, the no-fault divorce, then other um, states followed suit after that. But we today as Christians have lost sight of the fact that it wasn't always like this and that this is a new thing that you just get divorced. I mean, it used to be that when you got married, it's till death do us part. I mean, that was the normal thing. Marriage used to mean something in this country. And by the way, marriage is designed to protect both husband and wife. Marriage is not this anti-woman institution. I mean, where do people come up with this? The feminist. And then they say, if you don't agree with their feminazi agenda, then they call you misogynistic. And if you actually study the morphology of the word misogynistic, meaning if you break it down into its individual parts, okay, the miso at the beginning means I hate. And then the geni, like, is the same word or the same root from which we would get the word gynecologist. So basically, misogyny means that you hate women, hatred of women. So basically, if you teach what the Bible says, that women should obey their husbands, or that women should be a keeper at home, that women should actually, you know, get married and raise children and keep the house, then you supposedly hate women. That's preaching hate. You're misogynistic, you're hateful tonight. But people don't even realize that this no-fault divorce is a totally new thing and that historically everyone understood that marriage is a protection for both people. For example, you know, if I get married, and, and even if we're not talking about the Bible, because even in our society in the United States, even people that weren't even Christians got married. 
I mean, do you think only Christians got married before 1969? No, all people in the United States practiced marriage and it was just a normal part of our Western society. And obviously it's influenced by the Bible and Christianity, but even non-believers understood what the purpose of marriage is. You see, even just from a, a non-scriptural standpoint, marriage protects both husband and wife. Because if I marry a woman, then basically I have the assurance that she is only for me and that I'm not sharing her with other men. And illegally, it used to be against the law for my wife to commit adultery, you know, because she's married to me and that's part of the deal. That's part of the contract. You get married, you have to be exposed. And it protected women from their husband being out and sleeping with other women because of the fact they don't want him bringing home STDs and they don't want to share their husband just like husbands don't want to share their wife. So it's this voluntary agreement between two people to keep themselves only unto that person where the husband and wife will only be physical with each other and have each other to have and to hold till death do them part. That is what marriage is. Also think about how marriage protects women because what if a woman stays at home and raises the kids her whole life, right? While her husband's out building a career, building a business, making money. What if all of a sudden the husband gets to be 50 years old and just decides, I'm sick of you. I want to go marry a 25 year old. And then he just left the woman high and dry. Wouldn't that be a shame? And wouldn't that be a terrible thing to put the woman in that position where now all of a sudden she doesn't have a career, she doesn't have any livelihood, she doesn't have any way to make money, and here she is just left high and dry at age 50, you know, with no one to take care of her. You know, it protects both people. It protects husbands and wives because the husband, he provides, he pays the bills, and he stays faithful. And the wife, she stays faithful to him, and it's an agreement where they both come together into this union and the reason that it is enforced by law is because even the Bible said that the adulterer should be put to death. I mean, even God had a civil law where it was a crime to commit adultery. And this is an agreement that was entered in by two people that is enforced by society. So that if a woman just got sick of her husband, she can't just leave. And if a husband just gets sick of his wife, he can't just leave. Why? Because it's not fair to the other person. When you invest your life in somebody for 10, 20, or 30 years, for that person to then just walk away from you. So you make a lifelong commitment. That's what marriage is. If you don't want that type of lifelong commitment, then don't get married. Right. But that's what marriage is. Marriage is where you make a commitment and where you make an agreement that is mutually binding. But today, that's not how Christians see marriage today. Uh, marriage has been destroyed in this country. The institution of marriage means very little anymore. And even Christians today are accepting of divorce now. And, you know, a perfect example of this is what's going on right now where Dr. Kent Hovind's wife is divorcing him. Who's heard about this? How Dr. Kent Hovind's wife is in the process of divorcing him right now. I mean, how wicked. She's taking advantage of this feminist no fault divorce, this feminist, because if you look at the filing for the divorce, there's no reason given. It's just, I'm divorcing you because I can. This wicked Soviet styled, no fault divorce, even Christians are taking advantage of it today. And she's divorcing her husband, not because he's committing adultery or beating her up or anything. No, nothing like that's even listed. Not that those are even necessarily excuses to get a divorce, but no, because divorce is never right. God hates divorce, the Bible says. But no, she's just divorcing him because she can. How wicked. And by the way, this is, this is what's going on. He got out of prison about, what, nine or ten months ago, Dr. Ken Owen. He was in prison for nine years because of some stupid tax thing or, you know, the IRS came after him and... You know, he put him, in, put him in jail for not giving them enough of his money. But anyway, he got out of prison and he gets home to his wife. And, you know, he'd been preaching the gospel for decades and, and preaching the Bible. And he's not exactly doctrinally like us, but he's a, he's a brother in Christ. And he did a lot of good uh, teachings on the creation and a lot of good biblical uh, videos and things that he put out over the years. And many of you have watched his videos and profited from them and enjoyed them. And he gets out of prison after nine years of being in prison and he gets home and he gets home to his own house and he walks into his own house and his wife takes him down the hall and says, here, this is where you're sleeping tonight. I mean, dictating to him where he's going to sleep in his own home. I mean, what kind of feminist crap is that? 
This is Christianity today. I mean, the gall to do that to somebody after they've been in prison for nine years, you know, suffering, a man of God suffering in prison for nine years, and that's what he comes home to. But here's what happened. When Ken Hovind went to prison, basically his wife found another man to take care of her, her son, Eric. Her son, Eric Hovind. And let me tell you something. This Eric Hovind is one of the most wicked people out there. And I don't understand how anybody can say, well, I love Ken Hovind. I also love Eric Hovind. And I love to watch Eric Hovind and Ken Hovind. I think they're both great. Look, I don't see how you can feel that way when you understand what Eric has done and is doing to his dad right now. And I mean, this is the day that we're living in where children rebel against their parents and don't honor their parents and where wives rebel against their husbands and don't honor their husbands, where there's no respect or honor for the guy who's the breadwinner who worked to make it all happen. He's just thrown under the bus now as an older man. Wow. He's just cast aside now. I mean, after he paid for his wife for decades, he supported her, he took care of her, he nourished and cherished her for decades, kept himself faithful to her for decades and he's just thrown under the bus. His son, Eric, that was raised and taught and brought up by him, has done nothing but disrespect him and cast him aside, and the son is as wicked as hell. Here's why Eric Hovind is wicked as hell tonight. Number one, he preaches a false gospel. He doesn't preach that you're saved just by believing on Jesus Christ alone. He teaches that you have to do all this other repenting of your sins and turning over a new leaf. It's a total lordship salvation, a la Ray Comfort. Hardcore. Not even a little bit lordship salvation. Hardcore lordship salvation. Not only that, but after his dad went to prison and Eric stepped in to kind of take care of things and run it while he's gone, He took it from being a King James only thing to embracing all these modern perversions of the Bible. The NIV, the New Living Translation, all this other junk. He brings in James White and praises James White and praises everything that his father stood against. Then he raises all this money and says, hey, we're going to save Dr. Hovind's ministry. Hey, he raises all this money in the name of Kent Hovind and uses Kent Hovind's mailing list. And then he basically just stole everything from his dad. He literally stole everything. And it might be legal, sort of, kind of, barely legal what he did, but that doesn't make it right. Here's what he did. When the IRS was going to come in and seize all of his dad's assets, what he did was he had the company sell it all to him at pennies on the dollar. So he bought like $2 million of merchandise and equipment for like 6,000 bucks. So he buys everything for like 6,000 bucks or something, just some thing on paper so that he could transfer it to his own God Quest Ministries, which sounds more like a, a, a role-playing video game than, you know, a, a Baptist church or Baptist ministry. Not that Eric Hovind even claims to be Baptist. I think he's probably more of a non-denom kind of a, a type. But anyway, he, he plays this, this game of, you know, shuffling things around where he basically steals everything that was his dad's. Like, oh, dad, I'll just watch it for you. I'll just take care of it for you while you're in prison. His dad gets out of prison, and Eric's living in his house, sleeping in his bed, eating out of his bowl of porridge, and basically his dad comes out of prison to nothing. He's in prison for nine years. He comes out, he has nothing. Dr. Hovind even brought up the fact he had a pocket knife that he'd had for years. He held it up to his son, and he said, son, who does this pocket knife belong to? And his son said, it belongs to God Quest Ministries. He said, no, this is my pocket knife. No, it was, it was purchased by God Quest Ministries. All of his tools, all of his personal items, his own house, and even his own wife has been taken away from him. Everything was taken from him. He comes out of prison and nothing is there because his son Absalom took all of it away. It's exactly like the story of Absalom in the Bible. This fraud, this joke, this loser. And listen to me, Eric Hovind is a loser tonight. Amen. His preaching sucks. Nobody listens to it. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody cares. Everything that he does and produces is riding on his dad's coattails. His ministry would be nothing without all of his dad's money, his dad's infrastructure, all the equipment that he inherited, quote unquote, stole from his dad, all of the gear. I mean, when you start a business, there's a big startup expense. Well, Hovind spent decades building up all the warehouse and the inventory and all the stuff. 
and Eric comes in and rides on dad's coattails. Nobody would ever even give a flip about Eric Hovind if his last name wasn't Hovind. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen to that moron, that loser. Have you ever heard him talk? He's an idiot. Yeah. He's a fool. He's not a man of God. He's not spirit-filled. He doesn't preach with boldness. He's a loser. Yeah. But it's all riding on daddy's coattails, but then he takes his dad and throws him under the bus. No honor, no respect. And now he enables his mother to divorce her own husband with Kent Hovind's own money and resources the infrastructure that he stole from his father. I can't even understand how anybody would follow that ministry or care anything about that ministry. It's, it's, it's nothing like even what Kent Hovind even put out in the first place. But he continues to make money off of and profit from Kent Hovind's ministry and his work. Even as he throws the person, Kent Hovind. Look, last week, he evicted Kent Hovind from his own house. And he, didn't, he wasn't even man enough to come and tell him, Dad, get out. He just posted an eviction notice so that when Ken Hovind woke up in the morning and stepped out, there's an eviction notice. You have 15 days to leave your own house. He's been, listen to this. He's been paying rent. Are you listening to me? Ken Hovind has been paying $600 a month every month since he got out of prison to rent a small room in his own house down the hall from his wife. He's paying 600 bucks a month to rent a room and now he's being evicted from his house. We don't want you. We don't want you around, David. Go cross the Brook Hydron, David. Absalom's in charge now. And then that fat slug, Paul Taylor, that disgusting, Bible-corrupting false prophet that he brings in to replace Kent Hovind. Unbelievable. It's wicked. This is the world where, oh, but it's so wonderful. It's so modern. It's so feminist. You go, girl. You go, Jojo. You know, yeah, you just drop your husband, you drop that zero and get you a hero. It's wicked. It's garbage. Look, when, look, you say, well, but he went to prison and, and she had to go to prison for a year and whatever. Hey, you know what? It's for better, for worse. And you know what? She loved all the good times with him. She loved it when things were going good for decades, when things were going great, when things were awesome. And then things go bad, and then all of a sudden, let's just throw your husband under the bus now. Let's just throw your mom and dad under the bus. Let's just throw your wife under the bus. Isn't that so wicked? Yeah. You know, it's just as wicked for a husband to, to discard his wife. Yeah. Yeah. You don't discard your wife. You don't discard your husband. It's for life. Right. You love them. Amen. Amen. You honor and keep them till death do us part. That's what, that's what we swear on an altar when we get married. That's the commitment that we make toward marriage. And let me tell you something. You think that I would have, you think that I or any other godly person would have their mother living with them in their house as she divorces her husband? Oh, here, com come live with me, mom, while you divorce dad. Come here. What in the, what in the world is wrong with these people? But this is, this is evangelical Christianity today. This is just one example, but divorce is being accepted and, and completely normalized all over churches. Look, I've been in a church, I was in an independent fundamental Baptist church where people were getting divorced every single year. And literally people in the church would get divorced from one another and then they would remarry other people in the church. I mean, think about tonight, look around at the husbands and wives. Can you imagine coming back two years later and different husbands are sitting with different wives? because they've divorced each other and married someone else. But that's what it was like in a church that I've been in. I could point to situations like that, that I've seen in my own lifetime. Oh, but it's so wonderful. It's not a broken home. It's wonderful. Take pride in being, I mean, why don't we just make a t-shirt with an Icelandic flag that says bastard pride, yeah. divorce pride. <laughs> it's wicked. I got, I got a little off on Eric Hovind there, but I need to get back to Iceland. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, I, Scandinavia is the happiest place on earth. Now, first of all, number one, Disneyland is the happiest place. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but people will constantly say, hey, Scandinavia is the happiest place on earth. Who's heard this about Denmark and, and Iceland and Norway and Sweden being the happiest place, right? Haven't you heard it? Well, before we get into that, let's go to God's happiness index. God's happiness index, okay? Go, if you would, to Psalm 144. We're going to get God's happiness index from the Bible. 
And I'm going to get into the, the so-called happiness of Iceland and Denmark in a moment. But let's look at God's happiness index first. The Bible says in Psalm 144, 15, happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Amen. So according to the Bible, the nation that's the happiest place is the one whose God is the Lord. Amen. Look at chapter 146, just right next to it. In verse five, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Amen. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 20, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Amen. Happy is he that trusteth the Lord. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Happy is the nation where the God that they have is the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. John chapter 13, verse 14 says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, this is Jesus speaking, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. You know, according to the Bible, happiness comes through serving others. Not being selfish and arrogant, and just going around and sleeping around for your own fun and producing bastard children for your own little ornament or your own little puppy or something, not realizing that you bring a life into this world that has the right to be raised by a mother and a father. Right. No, happiness comes through service. It comes through serving others. You know, and you say, ah, oh, you know, you're enslaving women. No, 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 women serving their husband is a happy life. That's a happy life for women. That's, that's not a, a negative anti-woman thing. James chapter 5, you don't have to turn there. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You know who's happy tonight? The people who endure the ups and downs of marriage and they stay married. Amen. That's who's happy. We count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender in mercy and of tender mercy. 1 Peter 3, 14, but if you suffer... For righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. First Peter 4, 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of, but on you, but on your part, he's glorified. See, according to the Bible, happiness is enduring. Happiness is serving others. Happiness is loving the Lord. Happiness is having God and salvation and Jesus. That's what makes you happy. Living a godly life. Glorifying God. Having the glory of God resting on you brings happiness, according to the Bible. Now, there were some men of God in the Bible who doubted this, this happiness index. Flip over, if you would, to Psalm 73. There were times when great men of God in the Bible, they doubted God's happiness index that said that happiness is through loving the Lord, worshiping the Lord, serving others, enduring for Christ. There were people who doubted this. One of the men who doubted God's happiness index was Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 12, verse 1, he said, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? So Jeremiah in chapter 12, verse 1, he kind of questioned God. He had doubt enter in. And he said, God, why are people that don't obey you, why are they happy, Lord? Why are these wicked people happy? Asaph, in Psalm 73, where you are, he felt the same way. He went through the same thing. Psalm 73, verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So what's Asaph saying? He's saying, you know, I looked over at Iceland and I looked over at Denmark and Sweden and Norway. And you know what? I was envious at their prosperity and I envied them. And I thought that they lived a happier life. There are no bands in their death. Verse four, but their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. These people have been listening to all these idiot liberals who told them like, oh, Scandinavia is so wonderful. It's like this paradise, this socialism. 
and it's so good over there. And they saw the little memes on Facebook telling them how cool it is to live in Denmark and how cool it is to live in Norway and Sweden and Iceland. And oh, it's so wonderful over there. You know, we're screwing it up over here, but man, over there, it's just like rainbows and unicorns and socialism, and it's so wonderful. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. Man, over in Iceland, they have more than heart could wish. They're corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? I, what do we need to get married for? What do we need to obey the Bible for? I you believe in the God? Go to church? What? We're Iceland. We're Denmark. We don't need that religious junk. Behold, verse 12, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. So he says, man, I feel bad saying this, though, because I don't want my kids to hear this. When I start talking about how cool Iceland and Denmark are and how the wicked are prospering, you know, and I feel like, man, I got a bum deal living the Christian life. That's what Asaph's saying. But watch what he said. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God and heard the sermon about Iceland. Then understood I their end. I went to church. I went to the sanctuary and the preacher straightened me out and I learned about their end. Amen. It's hell. Yeah. Hell is their end. But, but they already live in a hell right now. See, they're going to the literal hell someday if they reject the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. But even now, they live in what I call the nation of bastards or what I call the feminist hell. They're already there in some sense. Let's keep reading. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down in destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one waketh, o, so, O Lord, when thou wakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my rage. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. How could I have been so stupid to think that Iceland is a role model? I was like a beast to think that Denmark is, is, a, is some wonderful place. I was so ignorant. I was so foolish to think that the ungodly, wicked nation of bastards is better than living a Christian, godly life. Now, you say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. It's been proven to be the happiest place. Well, here's where this comes from. This idea of Denmark and Sweden and Iceland being the happiest place. I think Iceland is like number two right now on happiness. <laughs> It comes from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. This is who puts out this happiness index. The OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We've seen God's happiness index. Now let's get the world's happiness index, okay? The OECD has used these factors for calculating the happiness. You say, well, how do they calculate who's the happiest? What's the happyometer? <laughs> well, here's how they measure it. These are the factors. Housing, income, work, community, education, environment, civil engagement, health, life satisfaction, safety, and life work balance. And let me translate life work balance, sitting on your butt and working as few hours as possible. Right. Right. Yeah. 35 hour work week or 37 hour work week. Now here's what they're basically saying, that in order to be happy, you just get everything you want. Right. That's what they're saying. If you have money and everybody gives you what you want and you don't have to work a lot, and you're healthy, that's gonna make you happy. Now, is that really what makes you happy? Because if that were what made you happy, you know who would be the happiest people in America right now? The Hollywood stars. Because don't they have, let's go through the list. Do they have nice housing? The rock stars, the Hollywood stars, do they have nice housing? How about income? How are they doing on income? How about their work? Do they enjoy their work? What about community? What about education, environment, 
civil engagement, health, life satisfaction, safety, life work balance. But you know why they're not happy? Because that's not what brings happiness. You know what brings happiness? The Lord. Amen. The joy of the Lord. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Living a godly life. You know, what's ha you know what provides happiness? Staying faithful to the same wife for decades. Amen. Staying faithful to your husband for decades. That gets you happy. That's a happy life. You know what makes you happy? When children honor their parents. Amen. And when wives and husbands honor one another and stay faithful to one another. You know what makes you happy? Going to church with your family and worshiping the Lord and singing praises to God and reading the Bible and living a clean and godly life. That makes you happy. But according to these worldly people, happiness is based on housing. Housing is what makes you happy. You know, it's income, it's money that makes you happy according to these people. But you know what? There are people who have bad health that are happy today because the joy of the Lord is their strength. There are people today who live in poverty and own nothing that are very happy. Jesus said, blessed are ye poor. But no, 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 it's only the rich that are happy. Is that, oh really, then why are all the Hollywood stars constantly getting drunk, getting high, committing suicide, shoplifting, drunk driving on their fourth spouse? Because maybe they're not living the happiest life after all. But the exact, listen to this, you're not even gonna believe this. You're not gonna believe this. The happiness index says, oh, Iceland, man, they're number two. I think right now they have Australia as number one. Then it's like Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. All the Scandinavian countries are in like the top 10 or maybe even the top seven. But Iceland is like number two on this index, okay? But the same exact organization for economic cooperation and development has also put out a study on antidepressant use worldwide. And you want to know who the number one consumer of antidepressants is, how many doses per day, 101 daily doses of antidepressants for every thousand people. Think about that. 101 doses of antidepressants for a thousand people. That's more than 10% of people are, are getting dosed antidepressants. You know who's number one? It's Iceland. Iceland is number one, not number two, not number three, Iceland is number one for antidepressants. The same organization, these idiots that say, oh, they're the happiest, Iceland is the happiest place on earth. Oh, Denmark is so wonderful, and Sweden and Iceland. Oh, Iceland's number two. But you know where they rank as far as taking antidepressants? They're number one. So if they're so happy, why do they have to take so many antidepressants? Why the suicide? You know why? Because living in a nation of bastards isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And being an unwed mother isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And being a whore and a whoremonger and discarding religion and discarding Jesus Christ and discarding the word of God and discarding marriage doesn't make you happy. It makes you depressed tonight. And God makes you happy. I'm not on antidepressants tonight. And look, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands of who's on antidepressants tonight. I don't want to embarrass anyone. But I guarantee you that 99% of the people in this room are not on antidepressants and I'm here to tell you that God gives joy and happiness and the world's happiness index is a lie and fraud. God is the one who makes us happy. Amen. Turn to Proverbs 14 and I'll close on this scripture. Proverbs 14 verse 12. The title of the sermon tonight is Iceland, a nation of bastards. <laughs> foolish Christians today, foolish Americans are saying, well, we need, to, we need to get rid of all the liberty and freedom and, and free market economics. We need to go to a model more like Scandinavia. Have you been hearing this lately? Is it just me? Am I the only one who's heard this lately? Oh, yeah, we need to be more like Denmark. Look at Norway. Look at Sweden. Hey, I wouldn't live in that feminist hell for any amount of money. I don't care what kind of house you give me. I don't care what kind of car. I don't care about the beautiful scenery. I don't care about the education and environment and life to work ratio and where I can go and sit on my butt half the week and only work a few hours. I would never want to live in that feminist hell. Amen. I want to live in a place where at least there's some semblance of men being men and women being women. And I know we don't even know which bathroom to use anymore in this country, but at least we're not as bad as Iceland. 
So why would we look at them and say, well, let's get even stupider. Let's get even more faggoty as men. Let's get even more manly as women. Let's get even more godless. Let's get even more unchristian. So we could be like Denmark. And none of these people have been to Denmark. They've never been to Iceland or Sweden or Norway or any of these places. You say, have you ever been there? Yeah, I've been there. I haven't been to Iceland, but I've been to Scandinavia. And I've been to 13 countries in Europe. And I know what it's like over there. And you know what? Anybody who says that it's so much better over there just probably hasn't been there. Because honestly, I spent... I spent all together, if you add it up, the times I've gone to Europe, I've probably spent about four and a half or five months there. And I experienced all different phases of life over there. I went to school, I, you know, just as a visitor. I, I went to school for a week in Germany. I traveled around. I got to live in people's homes. I understood their lifestyle. I spoke the language. I spoke German. I spoke Norwegian. And I understood what was going on over there. And let me tell you something. You know what it taught me? Wow, we really have it a lot better over here in the United States of America. And obviously our country has serious problems, but you don't want to be like them. It's way worse over there. I mean, when I came home from Europe, when I was a teenager and I spent three months there when I was 18 years old, I literally, I felt like, wow, America is such a Christian nation. It's so godly here. Just because in comparison, it seemed godly because it was so much more wicked over there. But here's the conclusion tonight, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. So it's easy to look at people sometimes and say, oh, it seems so great. They seem so happy. Oh, look at that woman on CNN telling us how great it is. I got three kids with two different partners, and I don't have any shame. I think it's great. Who needs marriage? We're so free over here. You can just kind of choose your life. But you know what? In her heart, she's miserable. Yeah. She finished up that interview, and she popped an antidepressant. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> oh, it's so great. Oh, I just love being a whore. I'm not, I don't want to get married. I want to be a whore. You know, oh. <laughs> just so I can get through the day. For real. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Yeah. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Right. Yeah. You know what heaviness means? What does heaviness mean? Depression. Heaviness is the old word for depression. Because what is depression? Like pressing down? Heaviness. Yeah. Depression. The end of that mirth and that fun and that woohoo! Yeah, we're single mothers, yeah! It's depression. Yeah. Right. It's misery. You say, well, I'm never coming back. Well, good, I'm glad you got the whole thing while you were here then. Good, I'm glad you got to hear it while you're here about the feminist hell and the nation of bastards. You say, well, I don't think we should talk this way in front of children. Hey, I want my children to know what the word bastard means. Yeah. Amen. I want my children to grow up and say, well, I'm going to produce children within the bounds of marriage. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You say, well, I don't want my kids to hear this kind of preaching. Then you go to the watered down, limp wristed church down the street and you won't ever hear this kind of preaching, and you can grow up and raise your bastard grandchildren. You can raise your bastard grandchildren, but my children are going to hear this kind of biblical preaching. And you know what? We need to get the hard edge back in Bible preaching because the Bible is a hard edge, sharp as a two-edged sword, cutting book in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Iceland tonight is a nation of bastards. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And we thank you for preaching, Lord, that I heard growing up that kept me on the right path. And Lord, this kind of preaching is happening in almost no churches in America today. If we were to listen in to the sermons across America today, Lord, I know that virtually no church is preaching this way, or maybe just less than 1%. I know that there are still 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. But it's a small minority, Lord, and that's why our country's in the condition that it's in, Lord. Please help God's people to wake up and under this, understand the need for your word. Your word is the answer. Your word is the cure. Your word will fix everything, Lord. And help us to preach it and proclaim it and to live by it. And he that hath an ear, let him hear. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Song number 100.
Love. Call number 179.